Photography Daily. Are you ready for some light photographic philosophizing tonic? Photography YouTuber Sean Tucker is my guest, and over the course of the next half hour thereabouts, we'll be talking about a myriad of subjects, including projects. I'm fascinated by photographers who, photographers who can really sort of bear down and find a, a project, something that they can sort of focus on for an extended period of time and that they could have something visually to say. His own lockdown project. I'm busy writing a book. It's not a, it's not a book on photography specifically. It's on just creativity in general with, with sort of quite a quite a philosophical bent on it as well. We get honest and talk about the feelings many creatives are experiencing right now with work drying up or indeed non-existent. When you keep your head on your shoulders and definitely have a partner who can help you keep your head on your shoulders about and, and have a sober view about it where you don't just get rolled up in an emotional roller coaster of anxiety and guilt, I think that's helpful. It's just reminding you, you, you didn't screw up. This is not your fault. We talk about our skills as creatives despite many of us and perhaps, well, maybe this is just me still wincing about being described in a roundabout fashion as non-essential non-viable you know maybe you will have to do something for a little bit to keep your head above water but that skill is still there and will be as viable in the future if it's not still now maybe you just need to get a bit more creative about how you bring work in there sean's channel is not your typical photography youtube channel so we talk about the kind of person who views his films they want to think about why they take photographs they understand that it's not the camera that's going to help them take good work they want to think deeply about the the kind of longer road ahead and they they want to strategize a bit about how they're going to do something meaningful we talk about the currency of social media likes and the pressure that brings i know it gives them sleepless nights you know they they put out a video that doesn't have the viewer numbers they expect and it puts them into a depression um, i know people do the same with instagram looking at numbers on their photo on their photos and thinking it means something and it makes them miserable because they don't feel like they're succeeding it's it's a trap i really try and avoid and don't think about too much and stand by sean will give us the silver bullet answer to how to become youtube famous if you want a big following get naked or buy a puppy and we talk about the subject of one of his latest films tish murtha and why he's drawn to her work. There's something about it being less the pose portrait and more you feel like you're in a space with things that are happening and you're privileged to be there because there's an intimacy to it. Stories of life told by photographers. And today, that storyteller is Sean Tucker. Now, close your eyes, unless you're driving or taking a cliff walk or similar. I want you to do an imaginary audit of your photo kit. I am sure there is something that you no longer use in that audit, something that hasn't graced your photography needs for quite some time or hasn't been a guest in your, your kit bag. It could be a lens, it could be a speed light, perhaps it's a tripod, maybe a gimbal. You know, you bought that gimbal with good intentions and then you never took it out of its box, did you? Perhaps it's a camera. I'll need it one day, but you really never came back to it. Look at it, sat there in the corner, just wishing that it could be doing what it used to be doing for you. Well, today's show is kindly supported by mpb.com, who are the number one platform for buying and selling and trading used gear. So right now, if you have that kit that is collecting dust somewhere, it's time to think about putting it to good use by receiving money for it and putting that camera or lens or whatever into the hands of somebody who'll actually use it and love it. And right now, every time you sell or buy or trade kit, MPB will plant a tree, which is all part of driving the circular economy. Go to mpb.com. Thank you to those of you who've taken the time to write and comment on the, the last two days of episodes, where award-winning Reuters photojournalist Darren Zamet Lupi shared the story of his most challenging assignment yet, photographing his daughter Bex, as she undergoes treatment for a rare bone cancer. And some of that during lockdown too. It was, I know, a very difficult episode for some of you. It was honest and frank, and from a personal point of view, a complete privilege to present. And I also know that the second part was very personal in places. But if anything, it's shown me that you appreciate the story behind the pictures, and it's become something that we'll certainly be doing more of. Uh, Darren had said to me in our chats prior, before and after, that you always need to remember that you're a human first and a photographer second. And this from a photojournalist who's decided to pull people from the Mediterranean Sea when, as a photographer, he was sent on assignment to document refugees, not necessarily rescue. 
So the last couple of days have been a real education to me personally, and I feel truly honoured to have been able to be the conduit, if you like, for Darren's family story. Today I thought we'd uh, reacquaint ourselves with a photographer and filmmaker I also greatly admire. I've interviewed Sean Tucker before, way back in episode 5. Why is he back, Neil? I'll tell you. I think it's time to take a deep breath and receive some creative tonic during this time of creative anxiety. Now, I spend a lot of time on YouTube. It's where I go to research guests and photography in general. It's the rabbit hole I take refuge in when I need some light ent. And it's my saviour for mending stuff in a lockdown. Did I tell you we've just gone into one again? Unless it's electrics or gas, clearly. Then somebody really does need to be called in. I now watch more YouTube than TV, true. Sometimes I don't even watch it. I listen to it when I walk. I'd like to say run, but we know, don't we, really? Several years ago, the algorithm served up a photographer called Sean Tucker to me. And instead of simply telling me what lens I should be buying, here was somebody who was sharing his life story whilst taking me on his photographic journey. It was a breath of fresh air, an authentic narrative. But before I introduce Sean, let me play you three clips from his philosophy playlist. We all have our own list of resistances which we battle, but I thought I'd share mine with you and how I deal with them, in the hope that it will help you think about your own and help you find ways to beat them. Emotional intelligence is about experiencing an emotion and being able to assess quickly and understand where that emotion comes from, why it's there and what it's telling you. And it's amazing how often we get this wrong. A good way to assess for me whether I'm being emotionally intelligent about something is to work out whether my immediate response to an emotion is to blame someone else for me feeling something. And a lot of YouTubers will push you to be extroverts or pretend to be an extrovert by telling you things like you need to get out your comfort zone, you know, you need to be louder, more assertive, put yourself out there. And even the example you're given is the most successful people seem to be the louder ones. But I hope this channel creates a safe space for people who that's not your personality. Because I really believe that you can actually make a success of what you do, but be true to who you are. So Sean Tucker is my guest today, photographer, YouTuber, photographic philosopher. And over this and the next Thursday, he'll share his thoughts on running a photography YouTube channel. If that's something that you've thought, well, I wouldn't mind having a go at that. What drives him to make pictures? How he's dealt with being a creative during the pandemic and authenticity. 2020 has been a, a funny old year. There's an under, under, uh, understatement uh, in terms of being able to do what you've wanted to do. Uh, what, what's it prevented you from doing, Sean? But, but equally, actually, are there any opportunities, anything that you've started doing which you, you would otherwise not have tried or found time for usually? Uh, and, uh, and the listenership will not have had the, um, the pleasure of listening to us talking about gaming, which I never had you, I never pegged you as, as, a, <laughs> as a gamer. But, uh, Guilty. <laughs> but what, what, what's been happening? Um, I mean, the, the obvious stuff I've lost out on is all the, is all the kind of travel stuff. So the, I, I had lined up for this year um, uh, the first of a bunch of uh, retreats that I wanted to run, creative retreats that all had to get oh, yeah. uh, pulled. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, uh, travel to do sort of talks and workshops and that kind of stuff. I was pretty much away every single month somewhere, and that's all sort of been pulled. I mean, the, the, the one that's a real shame, it, it's still going to go ahead potentially next year, but was uh, Antarctica in yeah. December, which was uh, looking really exciting. But, uh, yeah, obviously being on a cruise ship at the moment isn't a good idea. Mm. So. What what um, about the retreats then? Are they likely to return next year or year after? Definitely, I'm really excited for them because they're not they're not really um, photography workshop. I don't really do that. I, I tried, and I just I just realised like most of the stuff that I'm going to teach people technically, I've taught in a video somewhere anyway, so it's repetitive. And I thought, what about just having like a a getaway to a nice little it was actually a nice little spot in tuscany which was sort of an old converted farmhouse beautiful place on the top of it a kind of wooded hill had 14 separate rooms en suite and just have you know 12 to 14 people come through and we spend the week together and then it's um we do things like uh, we cook together you know we get we get uh, people to come through and teach us how to make pasta and we do that mm-hmm. for a day and then we do some food photography around that maybe and then we take some day trips to some of the local towns and walk around maybe do some street photography maybe just hang out and talk and eat and then in the evenings watch some documentaries maybe some 
photography documentaries but other stuff as well and and they, they, you know do some journaling and we had a guy coming to do uh yoga for us as well and we had two gyms on the property and doing early morning runs and it was basically just like a we we put on a bunch of stuff and we just encourage you to 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 journal and talk to other people about where you are and where you want to be going and leave it that open-ended which just felt like a good thing to do. And I, I'm, I'm really excited about doing them. But mm. yeah, right now is obviously not the time. Right now, though, is a good time for uh, for making videos. Um, you're inside. You've had to you've had to alter the way you you perhaps structure your films at the moment. Uh, I mean, in terms of the, the videos, like I've, j I've just started doing videos um, on photographers that I, I'll never meet, but I just know them through their, mm. their books. The Tish Murtha film. Yeah. And I, I, it's something I've had on the cards to do for a while because I love the, the artist series video that Ted Forbes used to do. Yes. Um, which he's which he's obviously uh, moved on from, and I thought it would be uh, it's a space I, I I took a lot of value out of those videos specifically, and no, they definitely don't get the views of other videos, but I'd like to kind of step in there and 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 do some of that for other people, M maybe just with the slight difference that I'd like to focus on less known photographers than kind of the 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 the, the big names, just to sort of find. Um, these sort of quirky books that are out there are people who tried something different because I, I'm fascinated by photographers who photographers who can really sort of bear down and find a, a project something that they can sort of focus on for an extended period of time and that they could have something visually to say um, and I feel like I need to learn in that space so looking at those kind of things at the moment is helpful so that that is going to become a series and was always on the cards to do as a series, but lots of other stuff came up. But now with lockdown, obviously, and this year and things being cancelled, the documentaries that I was doing meant that I was traveling to photographers to interview them and create these little films around what they do. Mm. I can't really do those right now. So these have kind of stepped in the gap, but they'll definitely carry on now alongside those other documentaries. And you've been working, on, I know, on a book as well. Are we allowed to talk about the book or is it is it hush hush? <laughs> not anymore no, 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 no. well no, i was wondering it, whether i was about to edit that no out, no it? it's not hush hush at all no time. um i yeah i've uh I'm, I'm busy writing a book it's not a it's not a book on photography specifically it's on just creativity in general with with sort of quite a quite a philosophical bent on it as well so the way i'm pitching it is i i, I always think of with my YouTube channel, I was thinking my core audience are the people who subscribe because they like that philosophical playlist I've got on there. So this is this is taking that sort of material that I, I try and write in a way that is relevant to anyone of, of any artistic ilk, not just photographers, and fleshing that out into a into a book that sort of adds a lot of my story in as well and the things that I've learned along the way, and and sort of the the bigger picture stuff like why are human beings driven to make things? Why, why do we do that? Why, why why is that something that we find so satisfying? And, uh, you know, throughout history, we've always felt the need to make stuff on some level. Like, what's that about? So, yeah, I mean, I, I've been working on it since uh, June-ish, I would say, in earnest. And uh, I have a manuscript deadline for, for February with the publisher. And then um, probably release sometime... I would say spring, early summer next oh, year. Oh, very soon then. Yeah. Very soon. Yeah. 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 Talking about creatives, without wanting to get overtly political about this, but of course that, that word viable popped up in Parliament. And I think a lot of creatives now <laughs> yeah. are feeling um, you know, unviable or non-viable. Yeah. What is, what is the, the correct word? And it's been a very difficult time for creatives in, in that way because now, now we feel like we're perhaps, I don't, I don't know whether we're purposeless, that, that would be a shame, but certainly it's, it's an anxious time for creatives, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, and obviously this is all fresh in my mind because I'm writing about this stuff at the moment. I, I think uh, especially when you think about a job as a creative or making money, I mean, that's where the anxiety is right now, isn't it? Because uh, I, I, I try and separate that out from – you don't need to make money in making things to be viable as a, as a creative person, obviously. Mm. Like, mm. you can just do it for the joy of it. And I think there's there's something beautiful about that on its own. But, yeah, I mean, right now, trying to uh, make money as someone who is a creative person, is, it's harder than ever. I mean, my wife, I'm sure she won't mind me sharing, but she... Um, she is a, a professional retoucher and she's worked for some of the biggest photographers in the world. Mm. And uh, at the moment, she's had to go and get a job at the pub because there just is nothing coming in. And uh, obviously, people aren't doing shoots the way they normally do. And the freelance work just isn't flowing. It's all a struggle. 
and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really anxious time. So, I mean, obviously that has, that's definitely impacted our household in terms of finances. Nothing she's done wrong. She's done absolutely nothing wrong. She's, a, she's, she's incredibly talented at what she does. And yet through no fault of her own, she's finding herself battling to keep her head above water in terms of keeping it working. I'm so in, I'm intrigued about the dynamic in your house then without wanting to pry too much. You've got two, create, okay, two very good, very strong creatives in their own arenas one not doing what they really want to do and and one being able to continue that that must be that must be quite stressful in 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 the dynamic mm. yeah it's um i mean i think i think uh, we we work very separately is the truth actually we don't we don't work on each other's stuff ever and we've taken quite different paths and we care about different things creatively so from that point of view we've always kind of split stuff out and it's it, it is kind of separate it's great having someone in the house who like is is far better at um, editing images than I will ever be to to ask advice of when i get stuck and similarly if she's taking photographs to edit you know she can ask me for help with that kind of thing. Mm. So, so in terms of career path, we're we're on very different trajectories. But I mean, I think we're we're also very good at being supportive with each other. And you know, I've reminded her a bunch of times: this is this is not your fault. You've done nothing to create this. Because I think the problem is the guilt, isn't it? Like, and I think that's the thing with creators being told to retrain. Is like, oh gosh, did I just pick a? Was was my mom right? Was I was was it a terrible idea to go off yes. to art college because yeah. it actually isn't a good career option? Yeah. But no, of course that's not true. You know, it, it, things ebb and flow, things that are way out of our control in terms of, you know, global economies and pandemics and all that sort of stuff. It doesn't mean that you're any less valuable as a creative person. And it also doesn't mean that just because you have to go back to waiting tables for a bit because the world's going through a rough time, that that means you're bad at your job or anything like that. I mean, I, I was waiting tables at my wife's age, actually. Um, she's nine years younger than me. She's 32. Um, but her age, I was waiting tables as a photographer because I couldn't get work in. Did it, did it mean I was a rubbish photographer at the time? No, it just meant that back in South Africa where I was at the time, there was very little work to be had. And, and I think when you keep your head on your shoulders and definitely have a partner who can help you keep your head on your shoulders about and, and have a sober view about it where you don't just get rolled up in an emotional roller coaster of anxiety and guilt, I think that's helpful. It's mm. just reminding you, you, you didn't screw up. This is not your fault. You know, maybe you will have to do something for a little bit to keep your head above water, but that skill is still there and will be as viable in the future if it's not still now. Maybe you just need to get a bit more creative about how you bring work in now. Well, and on that last note, getting more creative about the way you bring work in, I'll come back to shortly because I do have a question about that. But let's talk about YouTube. Last time we spoke, I don't remember the subscriber number for your channel, but um, I know it's definitely grown. And it's marching now inexorably to the 500k point. I would imagine you're, you're very pleased and grateful for, for that growth. But who do you see as your audience? Because in various films, you seem to address your audience as, as those rising up rather than working in it day to day. And what, yeah. is, what is a Sean Tucker viewer now, do you think? And has it changed? Um, I don't think so. I, th I think it's remained fairly constant from sort of around a year in. It's sort of settled into something. I, and I, I always think of... I think of my audience is mostly beginner to intermediate uh, photographers, probably, uh, although there are filmmakers in there and there are definitely a mix of other creative genres as well, who, like I said, just subscribe for that creative, uh, that philosophical playlist. And I would say that they are, they're, they're going to be people who care less about the gear. Uh, I hear a lot from them saying things like, we, we appreciate that you're not doing gear reviews or, or, too much about techniques and when i do too many tutorials in a row because the kind of strategy i have around my channel is that i'll do tutorials because youtube is a search engine first and foremost so people go to youtube to find an answer to a question they have so it might be how do i how do i take a portrait with with one speed light that's all i have so mm -hmm. they'll go on and they'll go portrait one speed light and then my, the video i did on that will pop up um the, the, the videos I care about more, it's very hard to title those in a way that it answers a specific question people are asking. So I know strategically that doing the tutorials brings in the new audience yes. uh, who will then go, I like this video, let me try another one because they're actually hanging around on my channel now and clicking through and goes, oh, that title sounds interesting and now I'll give him a little bit more patience than I would normally. And then they might find the deeper stuff and go, okay, I'm going to hang around for this. Then they might hit the subscribe button because the people who watch the tutorials don't actually subscribe usually. They, they get the little piece of information they need and they move 
move on because that's how they're using YouTube. So that my, my core audience, the, the people who hit subscribe, I think are the ones who find the deeper stuff and like it. The, the tutorial stuff are the people who are just need the quick answer and are off and gone, which is fine. That's great. So yeah, I, I think I think that um, I think that describes them fairly well. They, they want to think about why they take photographs. They understand that it's not the camera that's going to help them take good work. They want to think deeply about the, the kind of longer road ahead and they, they want to strategize a bit about how they're going to do something meaningful. And it may be the algorithm. I don't know, the fact that during hard and soft lockdowns, I found myself engaging with more thoughtful and philosophical programming on the platform. But mm. but YouTube does seem to have started serving that up more for me. Does, does it seem to have been a time for storytellers to flourish on the platform? Or what have, what have you noticed about your own engagement? Or, or is it maybe that I'm watching yeah. so much philosophical stuff, it's not yeah. giving me the cute cats and kittens anymore? I mean, maybe. Honest, to be very honest with you, I saw a dip during lockdown, which I didn't expect at all. Uh, uh, I assumed when everything went to lockdown, people would be spending a lot more time on platforms like YouTube. But it didn't happen for my channel personally. I, I saw numbers drop heavily in april and march for oh, example okay. and i couldn't I can't, I can't work out why i don't really think about it too much because it's beyond my control and definitely beyond my understanding i don't really know why it does it i just need to plow on and keep making stuff i stand by mm. it's such a mind-bending thing that and i think you, i think it's it's a very dangerous thing to play on, on on something like youtube or instagram for example trying to sort of beat the algorithm or hack it mm. because it, it, cre it could create so much anxiety i've got friends who are in the same sort of game and they i know it gives them sleepless nights you know they they put out a video that doesn't have the viewer numbers they expect and it puts them into a depression um i know people do the same with instagram looking at numbers on their photo on their photos and thinking it means something and it makes them miserable because they don't feel like they're succeeding it's it's a trap I really try and avoid and don't think about too much. I talked recently to another photographer, actually, um, a, a YouTuber photographer, and I, I asked him whether he was ever disheartened by this numbers thing by spending you know, so much time making beautifully constructed films. Yeah. Ca careful scripting, and which are you know, widely appreciated by, by your audience, only to be trumped by a title like um, Kid Having Tantrum or Fighter Jet Landing Goes Wrong. Do, are, are, I mean, are they head-in-hands moments for you, or is it water no. off the duck's back? No, because you know what it is. You understand the psychology. I mean, I, I say to people, if you, if you want a big following, get naked or buy a puppy. And then just <laughs> film it because I mean that that will give you a big following yeah, quickly. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what, yeah. if that's what you want, if that's what it's about. But then let's be honest about what that is. That's just that's just human psychology. It's just people who are around who want something flashy to look at or something cute to look at because they're bored for a minute and they don't want to spend too long in it. I, I get lots of people saying your videos are too long. Like the Tish Murtha one I put out, I had one or two people and they're going like, "What? Why am I six minutes into this video and I still haven't seen the images?" Like, well, because it's an 18 minute video and I want to set the background first. I want you to know who she was and where she lived and what she cared about. And then when I show you the images, hopefully they'll mean more. That's how a lot of YouTube thinks is, is that I want, you said in the title this, I want it quickly. I want it, I want it, I want it within seconds so I can yeah. get out of here. And that's a lot of people and that's fine because the flip side of the coin for having the audience that I have is I think I will always, I, I will hit a ceiling at some point. Uh, of people who want the kind of content that I do. And it might be just around the corner because I, I don't think I cater to the general YouTube viewer with the stuff that I do. I ask for more patience from people. The stuff that I do is more wordy than most people have patience for. And I, I'm aware of that, but I like doing that sort of content because it's the stuff I like watching. So I'll make it for the people who like it and they can come. And the majority of YouTube won't like it. And that's absolutely fine. Mm hit that ceiling when i hit it and that's my audience and and i think just having that sober view prevents you from thinking it's this this endless pool of ridiculous numbers that you're chasing it's not important and it's not relevant and it doesn't it it it, it will just ruin your experience of the whole thing i think well you've had let, let's talk about tish Murthy. you've had some interesting titles of late uh, you released that film by the way on the 17th of october you weren't to know and i i wasn't expecting a card but that was on my birthday and i thought oh, oh. There's, there's a nice birthday prezi from from sean uh, we <laughs> <laughs> um all that work you did for the month i appreciated it um I, i'll admit to not knowing her work ashamedly actually which shows just how rich the landscape is with present oh, yeah. and past photographers she was she was a, an influence to you, but how did you come across her work? I, th I think it was, was it in the gallery where you first saw her? Or, or yes. had, had you heard, you hadn't heard of her before? No, I, I hadn't heard of her. It was probably 2017, I think. It was, I was in the, um, the photographer's, uh, photographer's gallery, gallery yeah, in yeah, London. Yeah. And there was an exhibition of her youth unemployment work and some other stuff from her as well, the Ellswick Kids stuff and the juvenile jazz bands. 
Um, yeah, and I, I, uh, I think I said in the video, I, I find the photographer's gallery a bit of a mixed bag because sometimes it's just so uh, abstract. Some of the, mm. I mean, I went to an exhibition once of it was just a camera that they'd set up in a in, in one of those shooting stalls in a fairground, you know, yeah. and they they'd wired the the trigger on the gun to the camera so that it 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 took a shot at the moment someone pulled the trigger to shoot a pellet at a balloon or something right. and it was just a yeah. hundred shots of that and i'm like i don't i'm sure someone gets this but i'm not that guy this is just slightly too abstract <laughs> so yeah but I, I walked in and it was i don't know if you've had this experience just sometimes when you go to a gallery and you just two photos in you're like oh this is this this just connects with me somehow mm. there's a story to be told mm. and then it, it changes your i kind of walked in sort of dragging my feet going i you know i should be a bit more cultural let me go in and you know take some time and effort instead of going and just going to the movies or something and i you know and then your your step picks up because you suddenly realize oh no gosh this is amazing like i'm really i'm really gelling with this mm. and she does she did the kind of work that I would love to end up doing. And so the, I, so I, the I, social I, issues, maybe not specifically social issues, but but on the on the flip side, maybe. Um, but m the, the kind of visual storytelling and the the kind of the depth of humanity she's putting in her work, like you re you really are, you really are getting sort of unpolished. It, it, I, I sort of put her in the same bracket as, uh, uh, you know, what Salgado did um, in the way that he shot refugees or workers or, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that kind of thing. I think, I think I've always enjoyed, for example, someone like a Steve McCurry, but I, it's not quite what this is, even though I, I revere Steve McCurry. I think his work is incredible. Mm. Um, and he's a huge influence on me as well. But uh, there's, there's something about it being less the posed portrait and more you feel like you're in a space with things that are happening and you're privileged to be there because there's an intimacy to it that wouldn't happen if i walk around the corner you know that that scene of kids hanging out on the street in in newcastle in, in the early 80s might get shut down because they'd see someone walk around the corner and change their behavior but because she took the time to be with them year after year they got so used to her and friendly with her that that she, they then give the camera something that is very hard to get street photographers couldn't get it or they might catch it by chance but they don't do it in the same way they don't hang out with uh, you know a group of people like that perhaps the word is investment actually sean because yeah. if you look at that's an investment of time that i think a lot of photographers these days don't have time for and that might be because of this sort of hectic go go world we live in and very much the same with don mccullin of course with the time that he spent in the east end getting shots yep. with people that were in his manner yep absolutely well he did he did an amazing talk about um the kind of the stuff up north he did an amazing set of images in bradford uh, up north which is also looking at sort of uh, poverty in the uk in i think about about late 70s as well so it's all the same sort of time period as well and he's got some heartbreaking images from the same kind of Mm. Era, you know, a whole family living in one very run-down room that's just falling apart. Was that the This no. Is England book? I'm trying to remember which one that was. Uh, I think some of those are included in that, but I, right. think that, I think This Is England is slightly broader than that as well, yeah. And Sean returns next week with more. Interview-wise, our guests next week include Denise Maxwell, the photographer who said no to COVID, the Australian firefighting photographer Cam Neville, whose bushfire experiences still leave me, frankly, in a state of genuine awe. We talk about a unique photographic auction and the stories behind the pictures being sold with photojournalist Edmund Terracopian. And Sean's back for the concluding part next Thursday. Tomorrow, of course, is Friday, which means it's our weekly photo walk with the mailbag. Be sure to visit our website for links on what you hear. And, of course, Sean's mentioned some things today which I will link to within uh, the episode page and if you can help share the show those podcast player reviews they're really helpful as are any and all shares that you make in social media like sharing on twitter and facebook and so on music in the show was from artlist.io and i look forward to photographing with you hearing from you and talking with you tomorrow photography daily is a loading zone production